Well, thank you very much, Professor Gregerson, for joining us today uh, to talk a little bit about um, Bright Line and talk about a lot of the subjects that were covered here over mm -hmm. the last couple of days. And my first question thank is, you. since you're a good questioner, some of the messages that I have heard today, which I really strongly resonate with, mm -hmm. is this notion of really casting your net wide, understanding who the broader set of stakeholders really are, mm -hmm. uh, as that, that this ecosystem serve. Um, and make sh making sure that you really understand at a fundamental level what's driving them. So some of the examples about much, much more community-centric, uh, driving the work from where the work is being done with the people that are engaged in that process and getting much more connected with that. So I really resonate with that. Can, um, can I share something on yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So, so it's, um, it's kind of imagine whatever ecosystem you're currently operating in trying to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And pretend that you audit your own travel conversation patterns within the system. Mm -hmm. you know, which nodes of that system do you get first-hand primary data by physically being there on a regular basis? And when you're there with the different parts of the ecosystem, how frequently do you get surprised to the degree that you'd feel like, I'm dead wrong about something and that's really uncomfortable and we need to step back and think about this and redo what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, Vibrant ecosystems have that kind of um, open passport travel going on mm -hmm. where people are engaging within the ecosystem deeply enough that they're getting stunned, surprised, perhaps uncomfortable, but that's how it becomes better. Right. And the second piece of audit is not just internally within what are the travel patterns and interactions, but how often do you go outside of the ecosystem to look at your own? Mm -hmm. And take, you know, and get again disconfirming, counterintuitive, but incredibly valuable data that could help you then go back into the space that you operate in and make a bigger difference. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think that proximity and that constant being there, um, where the work is happening, where the people are experiencing whatever that eco the value being delivered from that ecosystem, and it's not one size fits all, right? It's and it's constantly evolving and changing, and having to do that. And, Reminds me of some lean principles around, you know, go to the Gemba, right, to find where the, the actual, you, if, you, if you want change, you have to get close to where it's happening because then you understand it so much better. And so it brings me to my next question around leadership, which is, um, I know, a, a, a really uh, important topic for you. And in this ecosystem model, how do you think it changes the way leaders have to behave compared to where they might have been traditionally successful in their enterprise or their organization when they're now part of an ecosystem? Maybe they're the ones driving it or maybe they're a piece of it and they have to have a very different style of interacting with all the other partners in the ecosystem, perhaps a lot differently than what they have experienced in the past, not just the stakeholders, but also the, the constituent parts of the ecosystem that make it all work. So I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that. Well, um, so some good colleagues at MIT, Fiona Murray and Phil Budden, they run these marvelous programs, bringing ecosystem partners together to build better innovation ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So you've got, for example, an entrepreneurial organization. You've got a big corporation. You've got a university. You've got a venture capitalist. You've got, you know, fill in the blank. In each of those organizations, they're self-contained and probably a hierarchy, and that's how we operate often, unfortunately, within that space. Now you jump into the ecosystem world where I can't tell you what to do, right. you know? I may be the president of the university, but that doesn't mean I can tell you the president of the corporation what you're going to do differently so we can build an innovation ecosystem here in Vienna. So it's the first starting point from a leader's perspective to build that better ecosystem is to default to ask, not tell, mm -hmm. in all of these interactions. So when I move out of my safe zone, it might be the university, into a different zone like an entrepreneurial venture, I'm wandering into that space full of questions mm -hmm. instead of answers for what they should be doing. And if I have that default to ask mentality, and if it's humble enough that I'm honestly trying to learn something I didn't know before, mm -hmm. that's the key that opens up the door window to the potential that 
otherwise never would have exi existed. And, and I mean, I really would love to hear what you have to say about this, because I, it was, I was very curious about it as I was listening to the speakers. But you have this ecosystem, and this ecosystem is intentionally resilient, right? Because it, it's, it's this thing that can self-reform based on things that change within it and around it. But when I look at the rate of change of disruptive technologies and things that are, are, are unknown to us, how, how, do you, how do you build something that's resilient in that way, that can survive and even thrive through a period of rapid and massive disruption? Um, when we're operating on the edge of uncertainty, which is what you just described, mm -hmm. there are no answers. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is ask the new questions to guide us to those answers and construct them. Mm -hmm. And so then the issue for me becomes where and when within the ecosystem do we provide a safe enough space for people to feel wrong and uncomfortable about it and be reflective in order for the new questions to emerge and new opportunities and directions and approaches to surface. Mm -hmm. That may sound quite academic, but it's quite concrete. If I were to go into Pixar, the animation studio, they have specific moments, dailies, brain trusts, notes days. They have experiences and processes that say, here's the time, here's the moment. This is the chance to raise every tough question, every difficult issue about where we're at so that we can do better and move forward. At Amazon, it's called working backwards. And then the, this is, it, but the point becomes, at Cirque du Soleil, it's called the lion's den. Feels like them. But the point is, they've systematically created moments or a process where people in the system know, in the ecosystem know, this is where we need to step up and be full of candor and be vulnerable in order to make this better. And probably on a fairly tight, um, the, the frequency would be much, much faster than what we have maybe traditionally been used to so that you're getting sort of the signals about disruption and the impact that it has so that you can respond a lot faster to that and, and be less disrupted because you're being incrementally disrupted rather than massively disrupted by waiting. And so for me, yeah. three fun diagnostics as I wander through the ecosystem is, number one, do we have those moments systematically created or processes or events where we are full of candor and we do give the tough questions and the tough feedback? If we do that, <coughs> is it tough enough to create answers to three questions? Was I dead wrong about something today? Mm -hmm. Was I very uncomfortable about something today? And did I spend any time being reflectively quiet about how the ecosystem is actually working and the response I'm getting to this tough feedback or questions? And if, if, <coughs> if I finish a day, or especially a week, never being able to say yes to, I was dead wrong, I was very uncomfortable, and I was reflectively quiet, you can count on a dead ecosystem. Oh, yeah. and, so, and, and the vibrant ones, they don't leave these interactions up to chance. That's the point. It's purposeful, it's intentional. Well, thank you so much, thank you. Professor Gregerson. It was a pleasure to talk to you today and thank you for spending um, this time with us and really appreciated your insights and uh, learning from your philosophy. And, and I hope that I'll walk away from this being a better questioner. Well, <laughs> Duane, you asked some excellent <laughs> questions. One or two that stumped me really well. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you.